Welcome, I'm Halise Lieberman, the director of the Toby Center for Jewish Life and Learning here in Warsaw. It is my pleasure, as always, to welcome you to the opening session of the 2022 TJHT Talk series. We're glad to have you back after the break and welcome all of you who are new to our program. We are thrilled that so many of you have joined us and we look forward to a very exciting conversation ahead and many to come in the next months. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, Dr. Karolina Shamaniak, is unable to join us tonight. We wish her a speedy recovery, a refuah lima, and hope that she will join us and share her scholarship at some point in the future at one of our sessions. Our format has not changed. We will start with a 40 to 45 minute conversation with our guest speaker, Dr. Katarzyna Persson. And then we will take questions, as many as we can, from our audience. Please make sure that you put your question in the chat box. And if you'd like to let us know where you are at the moment of our broadcast, please do so. Let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Persson is a historian of Eastern European Jewish history working in the Emanuel Ringelblum Jewish Historical Institute here in Warsaw. She leads the Ringelblum Archive Publishing Project. Dr. Persson was awarded a postdoctoral degree from the Polish Academy of Science and is the author of numerous articles about the Holocaust and its aftermath in occupied Europe and occupied Poland. Her most recent book, Warsaw Ghetto Police, the Jewish Order Service during the Nazi, Nazi occupation was published by the Cornell University Press in 2021. Dr. Person, Kasha, if I may, we are very honored to have you with us and we appreciate that you have grac graciously agreed to shift your role from discussant to primary speaker. Before Thank you. It is our pleasure. So let's begin our conversation with a quote from Emmanuel Ringelblum. The future historian would have to dedicate a proper page to the Jewish woman during this war. She will capture an important part of this Jewish history for her courage and ability to survive. Because of her, many families were able to get over the terror of these days. Dr. Person, not all of us are familiar with the Ringelblum archive. So if you would please introduce us briefly to Emmanuel Ringelblum, its founder and creator, Oneg Shabbat, the clandestine network and the archive, we would be very grateful. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, of course, very briefly, uh, Emmanuel Ringelblum was a historian, a teacher, a teacher in a secondary school for girls, actually, which is, I think, something that really fits well with our topic and something that must have also played a part in, in the way in which he saw the role of women in, uh, in writing history and how he saw the importance in writing history of women as well. Um, he was a social activist, uh, increasingly more and more a social activist, actually, increasingly devoting himself more and more to social work and um, work especially among Jewish working class in, mm -hmm. in Italy, Poland, but also among refugees and people who are um, coming to Poland, deportees from Polish Jews who were deported from Germany, among others. Um, he was also a scholar on the side. He, was, uh, he actually had a PhD from Warsaw University, working mm -hmm. mainly on the history of, of Jews in Warsaw and working, writing about that. So he managed to join all those three, um, three aspects of, of his life, and, and he did so also during the war. Um, when the war started, he was actually in Switzerland. He decided mm -hmm. to come back. He wanted, as he wrote, to be with his people. And uh, immediately after coming back, he threw himself into social work in, uh, in Warsaw. Warsaw, which was at that point, as, as many of you know, heavily bombarded already in September 1939, mm -hmm. and especially hit was, uh, was the Jewish quarter of Warsaw. So uh, he started organizing soup kitchens, which is, of course, a basic way of, of aiding those who can no longer uh, provide food for themselves and their families. Um, and he also started organizing something um, called the Jewish self-help, so the self 
aid for, for Jews, which was organized by themselves, especially he was interested in the so-called house committees. So uh, organizing mm -hmm. self-help on the level of a tenement building uh, where people within a building were helping each other in, uh, in surviving those very difficult times. And uh, at the same time, he started writing a diary, which is, of course, nothing that uh, is uh, surprising. People did. But his diary is, is different. His diary was more of a series of notes, something that was we can imagine, that was his aim, um, help the future historian in writing history of Jews under the German occupation. Um, so he started with those individual notes, and I think it's clear that very quickly he realized that this is not enough, that something more has to be done, and more sources need to be created, more than something he can do individually. Yeah. And that's how Onek Shabbat came, to, uh, came into being, the Jerry of Sabbath, underground arc of the Warsaw Ghetto, which uh, was set up around the time when the Warsaw Ghetto uh, was sealed off in the autumn of 1940. He brought in a group of people. First, his uh, people he knew from before the war, social activists, fellow teachers, uh, people he knew also from, uh, from Jewish political life. And together they started gathering documents which would serve future historians, which are Jewish historians. And that's really an important part of it because the key element of it was writing Jewish history, right? That the Jewish history would be written by, by Jews. It won't be written by Germans, it won't be written by Poles, it would be written by Jews themselves. So they start gathering documents. The group grows. Uh, it also uh, starts to include many women. Um, and they start writing about, about uh, first documenting life in the ghetto, so gathering those sources, then actually writing about it, so creating essays on the most important aspects of changes in the ghetto life uh, during the occupation. And then the third stage of the project is uh, informing the world, so actually spreading those news about Axel Reinhardt, so about the, uh, the progressing prosecution of Jews, and uh, sending it off to a Polish underground, Jewish underground, it also went abroad. Um, so these were the three stages of the Ringo archive. It was hidden in two parts in the summer of 1942, the third part, the first part in metal boxes. The second part was hidden early 1943 in milk churns, which were probably most readily associated with the archive. And then uh, it was uncovered in uh, 1946, the first part and the second part in 1950. Kasia, thank you for giving this kind of overall understanding, at least an entree into this incredibly, I would say, uh, a visionary project, um, which I don't want to call it a project because we know if it's important, it's its weight and end and how much it means to us, but certainly not only as historians, but as uh, individuals. So let's go a little deeper now that we understand, we are more familiar with Ringo Bloom and what he had intended, the people he gathered around him Tell us a little bit about those people before we focus on the five women that you've chosen. Who are those people who made up Onik Shabbat or Onik Shabbos, as you put it? They were actually not historians, contrary to what Max expect. Um, he decided that in order to write full history of, of what is happening to Jews in the ghetto, in order to write full history of sociological, demographical changes happening in the ghetto, we have to really look at all aspects of it. So he was uh, bringing in people who could bring in stories and very often individual stories because those large, uh, large phenomenons were very often written on the cases of individual families, individual people. So he was bringing in people who could bring in stories coming from people who are often underrepresented in history, in history writing. So uh, he would, for example, bring in teachers who could bring essays written by children there was a postman who would bring in letters arriving in the ghetto. Uh, there were people who were employed in the Jewish administration, which is, of course, to Ringer Bloom, who was, uh, who was involved in the underground, was not necessarily a natural uh, environment or people he would happily associate with. But nonetheless, there were people from the Jewish administration bringing in uh, documents from the Judenrat. There were people who were employed in the Jewish order service, the Jewish police, who were bringing documents from the Jewish police. Um, they were... Uh, people who are interviewing deportees. So people who are on the lowest rung of, if we can speak about survival ladder in the ghetto, people who are arriving in the ghetto with nothing on them and who very often very quickly die of either hunger or, or disease. And those people were interviewed in the last moments by members of the Onyx Shabbos. So basically he was bringing in people coming from all walks of life 
um, who all shared passion for documenting Jewish history, uh, who all shared his vision, but who brought in very different skills, very different backgrounds, who had different linguistic backgrounds as well. Some of them spoke Polish, some of them spoke Yiddish, and uh, who could contribute different aspects of, of Jewish history into the, um, into the Ringwood market. And among them were also women. So tell us about some of the women that, of, of the many women and men, as you say, come from diverse backgrounds, religious, secular, people in different parts of society, people, as you said, different perspectives, different walks of life, different ages. Um, introduce us to some of the women that uh, took a major role in contributing to the archive, knowing full well that it would be part of a historical tome that would tell the story. And then I, by the end of the war, I understand realizing that they may not have that possibility of writing it themselves, but that we as historians and others after the war would re be responsible. So please, who, should we, who, who of the many should we start with? Oh, there's so many wonderful women who are uh, in one way or another contributing to the archive and whose works are in the archive, even if them themselves were not part of it. We undoubtedly have to start with, with Rahel Auerbach, who is um, unfortunately Karen Neshmanik is not with us, who's an expert in Rahel Auerbach. But let me just say very briefly, she's the person most readily associated with women in the archive because she was one of the survivors. She was one of three survivors. Um, she was a... a a writer, a critic, a journalist, uh, already well known before the war and very active in, in Jewish literary circles before the war. Um, and in the ghetto, and I think this shows us really clearly who in the room would choose to associate with and who are the perfect people to bring in information, um, she, was, she headed a soup kitchen. And in her fascinating essay on, uh, on, on the workings of, of soup kitchens, uh, she described as an extremely astute observer how people who come into the kitchen, so people who are at that point already very poor, very often for many of them, that bowl of soup which they're getting was the only uh, was the only meal they had during that day. And she was describing her quote unquote customers coming to the kitchen, and then she was describing the decline, the physical uh, have health, the health failing. Uh, and the journey towards death, basically, because, of course, one soup a day was not enough to um, to sustain anyone. So she created this incredible piece of, uh, of, of ghetto history and description of this one element of ghetto history, which could only be captured by someone like her, someone working in this capacity who could who really describe people on the, uh, on the verge of death. She also wrote her own diary, which we have on the next slide, I think. Uh, which is an, another type of document contained in the archive. Um, it's a personal diary. Uh, it's a very intimate diary, actually. It's a very intimate piece of writing uh, in which she describes ghetto reality and she also describes her own emotions and her own reactions to it and her own personal internal world. Uh, it's a piece of writing of extremely high literary value as well. Um, and one of, one of uh, probably the most important uh, documents in the archive, but one uh, which also should be read for the, by those who are uh, who want to know more about about how people reacted to, to what's happening around them. Uh, on top of it, I should add that Rahel Alba, as I said, survived and was one of the key people driving uh, driving the search for Ringo Bumakai uh, after the war. So uh, she remained a very strong woman also after the war. And that she leaves Poland after the uh, archives have been. The, the two caches have been unearthed and begun to be cataloged. And she, like I believe the Vassars, who we'll meet later, um, moved to Israel. And we know that she serves as a witness as the Eichmann trial in, I believe, 1961. Does she continue? What is her work as she moves forward with her life? Does she continue to write poetry? Just curious. She does work a lot on, on, on uh, testimonies from the Holocaust. She does, she's among people who are working in, uh, in Treblinka with the Central Jewish Circle Commission. Uh, right, she actually wrote extensively about it as well. Uh, she was working, collecting testimonies. So she was, till, till the end, involved in, in documenting 
in one way or another the history, history of the Holocaust. And, and we can, I think, see it also with, with other life stories. Those people do keep work, they, they keep working till the very end, whether that end comes uh, in the ghetto, whether they, they manage to survive, like, like those three survivors from the archive. Thank you. So we've met Rachela. We know there's more to learn, and we will investigate with Carolina and others who have really delved into her life and her writing and how important it is. So in, these, in the archives, in the Ringelblum archives, there are more than 25,000 artifacts and documents, you know, photos, diaries, as you already mentioned, you know, personal diaries, also communal information, um, I think I was shocked to find, and many of us said there was, as you mentioned, there's a post office in the ghetto and it was actually functioning and there were reports about letters coming in and letters delivered. And you also suggested this is a way of collecting information that was then taken into the archive to be used as historical record. And there's art, children's drawings, children's notebooks and, and ephemera. There's also, I understand, carefully researched material with the idea of researching a topic you've alluded to it but um and it's really kind of incomprehensible in those circumstances that we can imagine someone with a historical sociological anthropological background going to research but i understand there's a lot of comprehensive evidence that was gathered um, which one in your opinion stands out as one of the most comprehensive pieces of research that really sheds light on the women of and their lives and their contribution to keeping alive and others in the ghetto well there's definitely one which has to be mentioned and that's a study by Cecilia Sopakova we have it on on slide as well uh, Cecilia Sopakova who was a, um, a writer a journalist also a very very important translator she came from a Russian-speaking Jewish family uh, she held um, meetings of, of other important literary uh, people from uh, from the Jewish literary life and then continued to do so in the ghetto. Uh, so she was very important in that scene, but she was asked by Ringelblum to interview women and to write an essay on uh, on uh, on Jewish women during the Holocaust. This is part of the second stage of, of Ringelblum's work when they already gathered documentation and they start actually processing it. So they start writing those in-depth essays which are meant to deal with various aspects of life at the ghetto. So there's an essay on children, on mm -hmm. the economy of the ghetto, on administration, and so on and so on, uh, on Jewish cultural life. And uh, what she was asked to do was write about women. And uh, that the title of, of, this, uh, of this program today, so about shades of heroism, actually comes from this, uh, this fascinating essay. Because what she does here is she interviews 16 women coming from all walks of life. And she could really have easily, if she wanted to, could have chosen women who are active in social work, people who we, as we consider to be typically heroic, let's say, right? So in a traditional w way of, of understanding heroism. But what she does is she brings women who cope with the reality of the ghetto in, a very, in very, very different ways, which are, uh, those ways are, are based on the background and where they come from, the previous history, the situation in the ghetto as well. So she talks to a woman who works as a cleaner and is a refugee. Uh, she talks to a woman who sells vegetables on the street. She talks to a woman who's a waitress and then gets involved in sex work in the ghetto as well. But she also speaks to social activists and she also speaks to a woman who holds a PhD. So they are very, very different. Uh, they deal because they deal with ghetto reality in a very different way uh, because they can only deal in a certain way. They're only given that many options of, and of of uh, uh, reacting to what's happening around them. But what they share is this unbelievable heroism of, uh, her of heroically taking day after day and surviving day mm -hmm. after day, uh, providing not only for themselves, but also for those around them. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the children, in, the most, in many cases, but in other cases, it's the parents, it's the siblings. It's the whole group of people who are uh, uh, reliant on their work. These are really in depth, fascinating in terms of literary scholarship, also fascinating uh, vignettes into the life of, of, of Jewish women. She writes about them, she describes them, she writes what they look like, how they act, and how they speak. And then she moves into the story 
which also importantly starts at the beginning of the war. It doesn't start with the closure of the ghetto. It usually starts at the beginning of the war, showing, and this is a really important in terms of historical sources, important, um, important documents, because it shows us life also before the, uh, before the closure of the ghetto. It shows us increasing persecution against Jews. It shows us the deteriorating situation and the way in which those women um, try to cope with it and try to deal with it. Does she, I'm sorry, does she name, do they come with names? Are there some sort of, you know, sense of who they are or they are just, are they just described? They, she doesn't use full names. We know one oh. of them. Barbara um, Bermanova is one person who's actually, uh, who we have deciphered. All the rest have only initials, uh, but she describes them so vividly and with so much emotions and with so much, I don't know if compassion is the right word, really, because she's in all of them. I don't think there is much compassion. I think she's actually in all of how strong they are. Uh, whatever they may be doing, even if that means that they wake up every day and sell vegetables by the ghetto wall because that's the only way they can survive, or if they go and smuggle, or if they do things like smuggling, which we may not consider to be heroic today. You know, We're not considered heroic during the war or after the war. Uh, so things which may be seen as questionable, which are not straightforward heroism, but for her it is heroism because it does, uh, it is part of this will to live, which they which they all share. Um, thank you for showing light in these shadows, in these shades of women, not only women, but obviously our focus is women, who we, as you mentioned, come from not only all walks of life, but today we may not label or call heroes, and yet the truth is living day to day and helping others or helping your family was an act of great, it required much energy and determination. And clearly those who helped others as well contribute that, that sense of resistance or the sense of humanity that as we read through the, the documents and we read through other testimonies began to be quickly eroded um, as the as the ghetto life becomes more and more difficult, and Axion begins in 1942. So, when she wrote this, if I may just go back, um, does she write it? If you can remind us of the time, does she write it when it looks like it might be? She might be the publisher. She would have time to edit it. She would have time to expand, or is it already something that's being written? feeling that this is the last moment I can make these records historically viable. It's both because she writes in the spring of 1942. So the moment when the situation in the ghetto is already deteriorating, when there's already a mass murder of Jews outside, uh, outside Warsaw, where the information is reaching Warsaw, where people still don't know how to process it, don't necessarily know how to understand it, don't want to believe that Warsaw will be next. So in that sense, uh, she may hope that she will in the future be more involved in the text. But I think what is important is that she also talks to women who are on the brink of death. There's one woman, the one who's a vegetable seller, who is hungry and is dying of hunger. And it's clear from description that she's dying, that this is the last, the last moment where her story can be recorded. So in that sense, this is the last, the last, uh, last testimony. And there are many others like this in the Market, of course, this is not just that one case where they managed to really catch people's stories, even before the deportations, in the last moment, before, uh, before they die. And this is especially, of course, deportees, but also others who, who are especially interviewed because they, are, uh, they, are, they belong to those groups, which are uh, most likely to be among the 100,000 people who died in the ghetto, even before the deportations. deportations. So... We must leave her for a moment um, because our time is unfortunately limited. But there are so many other women, and you've mentioned Henrika Lazarvot, who I understand is a poet, um, a member of Oneg Shabbat, of course. Tell us a little bit about Henrika. Henrika was a poet already before the war. Uh, she was uh, born in 1909, so she was 30 years old when the war began. And uh, 31, when the ghetto was closed, she uh, she already published two very well received uh, volumes of poetry, um, and in the ghetto uh, she began uh, she became involved in uh, 
and help helping children in centers in the work of uh, organization for help of orphan children. Um, and she also began working for social health. And she started writing those incredibly moving studies of uh, of uh, Jewish refugees and the deportees arriving to Warsaw. And uh, something where, where she managed to sort of mix the dry data which she, which she has with individual stories. So she shows us those big processes through little stories, individual stories of families, individual stories of children. Uh, and maybe I'll just read to you a quote from Manuel Ringelblom who was writing about, uh, about her. And uh, he wrote, she started to write monographs on individual families which moved readers to tears. She gave one of those to read to social activists who are closely familiar with the life of refugees, but they said that it was only the young writer who had opened their eyes to the terrible tragedy of each of the tens of thousands of refugees families in Warsaw. And this really is what Ingrid Markov is about, isn't it? It's, it's telling those little individual stories, which will be so easily forgotten in the mass of tragedy in the ghetto, but picking out those small stories, which together create tapestry of, of, of life, of ghetto life. Um, she was also writing poetry still in the ghetto. Uh, she became famous, if we can, I think the next slide will show us that, uh, especially famous for a poem, Little Smuggler. She wrote a lot about children. As I said, she was involved with uh, working with children in the ghetto. And uh, this poem, which you can see here, was uh, widely, uh, widely recited in, in ghetto theaters. It was very well known. And uh, she was especially known for that. Uh, she was unfortunately ill already in the ghetto. Um, she had problems with her lungs. And, uh, and she died together with her mother, whom she lived with. I don't know if I time, but can I just, I'll read another quote from Ringelblum, who was actually writing about, uh, about her. She wrote, uh, Was a Vertovna had a lung disease, but without a lot of cash, without some, of, some 10,000 zlotys, it was futile to dream of the Aryan side. She had many Polish friends, yet no one stepped forward to save her. During the first deportation, she perished in Treblinka with her mother. At the Umschlagplatz, they tried to save her from going in the train car, but they did not want or could not release her mother. Henrika Wazavertovna was well aware that deportation meant death, but she followed her mother anyway. So this is how she died. And uh, we spoke about her, and of course she's well known also because of that poem or because of her fame, or beginnings of fame before the war. But there's so many others, uh, who, women who are involved in social work, who are writing those stories of those people who would be so easily otherwise forgotten. And I think we have a slide of uh, an, um, uh, a, uh, an uh, report by Salome Ostrovska, who was the head of quarantine at Leszno Street. Quarantine was a place where people were, who were arriving in the ghetto, who were deported in the ghetto, had to stay for a certain period of time. Uh, it was a place of poverty, of uh, violence. Uh, and uh, she wrote uh, in, in this piece, which you can see in this report, uh, uh, she wrote uh, beautifully, an individual person disappears in the giant human mass. People are crowded. One cannot tell one face from another. Yet still, everyone has their own uh, problems and challenges. And this is really, again, what it's all about, right? Focusing on those problems of individuals to write a comprehensive story. And of course, we don't have, unfortunately, time today to be talking more about it. But I'll just mention something that I find especially touching and especially important in the Ringel archive, and those are the reports of girls who work in uh, refugee points in those places, in those houses which which uh, which were selected in the ghetto to house uh, people, as I said, arriving from uh, from smaller towns who were deported, who had everything stolen from them usually, and who were living there in extreme poverty, in extreme hunger, with they were ridden with diseases. Those places with uh, with tuberculosis and with typhus and and they were usually dying very soon. And those uh, teenage girls were uh, organizing, let's call them like children's corners, schools. They weren't even schools because they had no way of teaching them, right? But just taking children out of that mass of poverty and, and, uh, and unhappiness and organizing some sort of an hour or two a day where they could spend some time with other children, where they could be fed, where the food wouldn't be taken away from them. And those reports are wonderful and uh, extremely touching and also show us the bravery and 
heroism of those women who are still children themselves. Uh, and they, many of them remain nameless as well. Some had some signed the report, some didn't. So this is often something that's maybe less known and still part of the archive. Your description, which just draws us all in further and further, you've already illustrated in terms of the, the, the people um, and understanding a little bit more even about the, the geography. I don't mean just the way it was built, but people in the ghetto with, with different possibilities or lack of possibilities. You mentioned the, the marginal refugees who are Jews who are forced in from other places who are really, in a sense, foreign in a, in a place which is supposed to be I mean, sort of all together, a collection. And you're, you're illustrating, as you mentioned in, in, in some of your work, that these micro histories, it's like looking at a painting, you, you have to look at every dot to understand or even appreciate if that's the correct word, you know, the whole, the picture that the archives paints for us. So we, 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 we would like to go further. You're touching on so many corners. There's one more person that you had mentioned, um, and this is uh, Gustavo Yaretska. And we're curious, why did you want to introduce us to her? Gustavo Yaretska was already before the war an established novelist. Uh, she wrote four novels. She also wrote for children, so she was already well known uh, when, the war when the war started. And, uh, and in the ghetto, she was working in, uh, in the Judenrat, so the Jewish Council, where she worked uh, as a typist. She spoke well German, Polish, and got, it, got her work there. She was also uh, on her own bringing up two children, two sons, uh, from uh, her marriages. And uh, so we can assume that her living conditions they get extremely difficult. To be a woman on your own with two children was not easy. Um, and... Uh, when she was working in, in the Jewish Council, she was bringing to the, uh, to the Ringel archive copies of documents which were created by the Jewish Council. So an important piece of work in terms of, uh, of uh, academic documentation and something that we rely on today. Um, and uh, Marcel Reichranitsky, who was later became a very, very famous literary critic, was uh, working with her in the Judenrat and, and describing her uh, he wrote, he was extremely fond of her, I have to say. Uh, he wrote, uh, I can see her in front of me, a chestnut-haired, blue-eyed, slim woman in the early 30s, calm and quiet. She made a big impression on me from the start. Literature brought us together. Neither German literature, which she didn't know much, nor Polish, but we were talking about the French and the Russians. And I owe a lot to his conversations. So it really shows us uh, a little bit of personal life of, of people who are uh, members of the uh, of the archive and, and her most uh, important work was created already after the quotations and we can see it on the next slide um, it, this is uh, called the last stage of resettlement's death and that's probably the most famous and one of the most valuable in terms of literary quality if we can speak about it but I think we can in this case uh, descriptions of the last of the beginning of the potation from the Warsaw Ghetto, written from the inside, written by someone who's a, uh, who's going to be a victim of it soon. So this is a a rare description of, of the Holocaust from the inside. That's again what the archive is really about, isn't it? It's describing everything as it's happening by people who are, at that point, she's aware of it, going to be uh, to be victims of it. So this text is a really delicate and really difficult, I think, grieving process for the community and a grieving process for herself because she's also writing from the point of, of view of someone who will soon uh, be, be eaten by that, by the machinery of, of destruction. And we can see the next quote. It's actually a quote from that, uh, from that text. Uh, and I will read it because it's, it's amazing. Uh, we know the proof of guilt, which is useless for, other, for, for ourselves. The trace should be thrown like a stone under the wheel of history in order to stop it. The stone has the weight of our experience, which had reached the bottom of human cruelty. It contains the memory of mothers mad with grief after losing their children, a memory of the cry of children who were carried to the road to death without coats in their summer clothes, barefoot and walk crying, unaware of the horror which was happening to them, a memory of the despair of old mothers and fathers who had to be abandoned by the adult children, and the stone silence in a dead city 
once a sentence on 300,000 people was implemented. So the stone silence in that, that city is, I think, beautiful. I mean, if you can say beautiful, but it's an extremely uh, evocative uh, description. And, and in another part of the same essay, and I'll read that uh, here, she, she described why she was actually doing it, why she was writing it, was driving her. And she wrote, uh, these notes are driven by an instinct, a desire to leave a mark by despair close to crying sometimes. And from a will to justify one's life, remaining in deadly, in deadly uncertainty. We have noses on our necks, and when they loosen a little, we shout out. So it's amazing. And, and, and she was, uh, she actually died uh, with her children. Uh, she was taken away in, uh, uh, in uh, the winter of, I think it was in early 1943. She didn't want to leave her children behind, and, and she went with her children to Lincoln, like many others. It's, uh, it seems only that several moments of silence after each of these, um, these narratives, these people's lives, um, who had the courage to write it. And as you, as she, as she wrote so eloquently and you read, this is what's driving me, us, and which seems to have been the driving force behind the ring, all those who contributed in any way to the archives. Um, it wasn't a matter of publicity. It was a matter of, we have to, you mentioned this, we have to tell our story. We have to tell our story from our personal and communal perspective now, right this very moment. Um, and when we try to even comprehend what that means in the face of such adversity and terror, um, we can only, um, we can only bow our heads um, in, in gratitude that people were able to take this, this, obligation on. She writes about throwing a stone in the wheel of history, um, which is an interesting phrase. And when we move farther just a little bit, we find um, there are a, about 60 members of Onik Shabbat. Um, I understand that they didn't all know each other because they wanted to keep their identity secret so there would be some sense of security that they collected and delivered their documents to places that would be soon buried safely, you know, as quietly and as covertly as they could. And what we know is three members survive um, among those who were so committed and so involved in the archive. And we know that Hirschwasser, Ringel Bloom's secretary, his wife, Bluma, and Rachela, who we met in the beginning, actually are the three to survive. And of all those who survive, it's Hirschwasser who knew where the caches had been buried in 42 and 43. So tell us a little bit, if you can, about Bluma and Bluma the role she played, yes. Yeah, she's one of my favorite characters, actually. Bluma was uh, very different from the woman we already mentioned. Uh, well, she wasn't a writer, and uh, she, I don't think she had much literary talent. She was a teacher, and she was uh, Hershbass's wife. Uh, but she worked as a copyist for the archive, so she was copying documents in Yiddish, uh, a work which is very hard, uh, yet necessary for, uh, for the work of the archive. So in that sense, she contributed that way. But she also provided the archive some personal documents, which are really interesting, some letters. Uh, and we also have this, uh, something that's really important, which sounds really mundane, but it's actually really important. She uh, contributed the archive, her uh, book, in which she wrote down all her spendings during the day, the family spendings. I don't know what's the professional name for it. But uh, uh, she was actually writing down the, spend the household spendings, like a household book, and for over a year. And... Uh, it sounds really simple, but it's something that becomes a crucial, crucial source for us today when we research daily life in the Warsaw Ghetto, economics of the ghetto, changing prices, um, how people lived. And uh, so this is also such simple things like that, you know, we simple. They're not simple at all. They, are, they become treasures today. But uh, not all women who contribute the archive contributed with 
I think it should be said with works of, of incredible literary importance or works of art, some of them contribute things like Bloom added, and they are in no way less valuable, uh, especially for scholars today. Just one more woman. Um, Gela Sextein, because we can't finish this part of our session without mentioning her, and we'll come back to her at the end. Um, just wanted to uh, underscore something you just said, Dr. Persson, that the archive is a balance between sort of the holy, you know, the mo very profound, whether and then this mon what we think of mundane, which really becomes, as you said, it's the macro and micro histories, it's it's the large numbers, and it's the individual that make this archive so valuable for uh, all of us as historians, as yourself as a scholar, but all of us who uh, are committed to to Jewish history, but also understanding our role in our obligation. So before we open up to some conversations and questions from our audience, there's lots of comments and people we need to connect uh, with you and, and, and to the work at the archives. Um, please just introduce Gela, if you will. And this is Gela Sackstein, who was a painter, uh, born in 1907. So a young woman in the ghetto, she was a uh, already gaining fa fame before the war. She was mainly known for her drawings and her watercolors. Uh, she often drew children. She was working with children. She was teaching art in Jewish schools. Um, she came from a working class family, but uh, she became, it was clear from the very beginning that she was extremely talented. She started in Krakow, then she worked in Warsaw. And uh, before the war, she married Israel Liechtenstein, a, uh, a man who later hit during a mark night, uh, a director of a Jewish school. And uh, together they had a daughter called Margolit, who was born just as the ghetto was being closed in November 1914. In the ghetto, she was bringing up her daughter. Uh, she was teaching art and she was drawing. She was drawing what she saw around her. And those paintings, those drawings, uh, as well as some of her pre-war drawings, were deposited in the archive by, by her husband, by Israel Lichtenstein, and uh, are probably among the most, the best known artifacts from the archive today, those that the archive is really associated with, especially those drawings of children. And she also left her last will, which uh, is also one of the most uh, important and uh, striking uh, documents which are enclosed in, uh, in during the marker. Um, we will read an excerpt of it at the end of the program. Um, so. Dr. Pearson, you've introduced us to five women among many and of also men and children. And you've also introduced not only the mundane and I would say the holy, but some truths. You mentioned that people who are working for the Judenrat, um, who may have, and the police, um, who today we may sit in judgment or question their role. Um, at least there's, the archive is, replete with, you know, the truth, whether it is good for us, as it were, or negative, the, the, the goal was to tell the truth. And so let's open up to some questions. We have, I want to start with a comment from Avital Bloch. And let's see if this um, resonates with you. My grandfather Eliezer Lipa Bloch was on the Oneg Shabbat main team with Auerbach and some others. He was caught when smuggled to the Polish area of Warsaw and was taken to the camps and died in Matthausen. Is that a name? Absolutely. Uh, Elisa Bloch was one of the key members of Onek Shabbat, of course, one of the inner circle, you may say, because of course there were many, many levels of, of being a member of Onek Shabbat, but he was one of the key, um, key members of the, of, of, the, uh, of the team and one of the most important ones, undoubtedly, who are... Um, fulfilling the mission of Rengard Woman and deciding also on the direction which the, the archive should be going and the way in which the research should be should be further developed. Um, working on, as you just said, the all, all shades of life and uh, as Rengard Woman wrote himself, the whole truth, however difficult it may be. Thank you for, for shedding some light and thank you, Avital, for sharing that. Um, Please share as much as you can, as much as there is information in the archive about the archive, Dr. Pearson and other scholars 
I think all pieces that are ingathered here by people who are with us are really helpful um, to shed light, but also to get, connect all of us. Um, there's a question here um, about um, from Avi, Avia Khan, and she asks, um, can we find out, do we find out from the Ringel Bloom archives how large an element in women's experience was played by religion? Uh, absolutely, though, uh, Ringel Bloom archive was a secular undertaking. Mm -hmm. it, there was a rabbi, Shimon Huberban, who was a member of the, uh, of the team, and his, uh, his uh, task was to, to describe Jewish, uh, the destruction of, of Jewish religious life and the experience of um, of religious community during the Holocaust, and, and he did so. And there's also uh, a section on uh, on the uh, on the violence against Jewish religious women. In that sense, absolutely. Uh, we also have sermons in the uh, in the archive, which were uh, delivered by uh, by Rabbi Shapiro, which form an important part of the archive as well. Uh, so in that sense, yes, the, the experience of, of the religious experience is also an important part of the archive, and it was purposefully done so in order to uh, to show, as I said, that the variety and the the fullness of of experience during the Holocaust. Thank you. Each question um, requires your answer, but I know we have to be brief. The question, another question is, and this one I'm sure you've heard before, we all have, is the search continuing for what seems, it says, is the last part of the hidden archive, perhaps now under the Chinese embassy. Can you speak to that? I think that's a very, very big discussion <laughs> <laughs> over whether there actually was a third part, whether uh -huh. it was something else, if it was maybe some sort of underground archive from some other organizations, not necessarily from like Shaba. So, uh, we don't really know if there ever was a third part, I think. And uh, I don't know if there any more work is being carried out. I, there was work carried out, yes. which didn't result in coming across and finding the third part. And I think there is no um, justifiable uh, questioning whether the third part ever existed. And maybe what we have is actually all there ever was in the Ring of Marchai. If there was a third part, then we'll be mainly covering the last stage of ghetto existence between uh, winter of, of ni early 1943 Absolutely. and possibly the Warsaw, uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Possibly those will be documents mainly linked to the underground, if they exist. Thank you. So before we end, um, and we'll share more of the questions because they're thought for broking and um, I'm sure you as a scholar would be interested to hear what people. Um, and we, what would you like to add um, you've sh we really appreciate the, you know, your comments, how deep you've gone, the passion you've shared, your knowledge. You really brought these women this time into our into our living rooms and wherever we're sitting. And what what else would you like to add? What would you like to leave us with? I think that we should read the Ringo Markov. I think the best thing we can do, both as a academic scholarly undertaking and as a commemorative undertaking as well when it comes to those people, is reading during the archive, is uh, looking at the documents, which are now available online as well, and, and, and finding out the stories and sharing those stories. So can you share with our readers, there's, there's online archives, um, online access, which we will share in our resource letter um, in a follow-up email, um, and as well as there are English versions um, yes. available about from the archives themselves. Can you speak just briefly about what volumes are available? Yes, we have a, a full, uh, there's a Polish edition, which is a full translation of the Ringo Market into Polish. So how about in Polish, half in Yiddish, and, and scholarly edition. We're now doing it also in English. Uh, there's five volumes already available. The first one dealing with social life in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, then the second one of the experiences of uh, Jews who are in Eastern Poland later on the Soviet Union. Uh, then the third one on the inner works of Onyx Shabbat and its projects. The fourth one on experience of children in the ghetto, uh, which also includes those reports of, of the girls in the refugee points, which I mentioned. And the sixth one of reports from um, escapees from Treblinka, which show us the first information about uh, Treblinka reaching the uh, Warsaw ghetto. 
Well, thank you. Your work is inspiring. Um, and we will take it on upon ourselves to read and learn more and also to share the story um, of what you're doing and contributing in bringing the archives to life because what we understand from your presentation and other scholars, that was the purpose of creating the archive um, and burying it for safekeeping so that we could uh, inherit it and take it on. I would like to uh, thank all of you for joining us. Again, I would like to thank Dr. Pearson for an inspiring conversation. Um, and we hope to hear more from you about your work and more about the archives. Thank you and kudos to the TJHT talk team. We look forward to seeing you all on the 23rd of February. You'll have to uh, read the final slide or look at your newsletter for information about that. But I would like to conclude with this excerpt from Gayla Sechstein's Last Will and Testament. As I stand on the border between life and death, certain that I will not remain alive, I wish to take leave from my friends and my works. My works I bequeath to the Jewish Museum to be built after the war. Farewell, my friends. Farewell, the Jewish people. Never again allow such a catastrophe. Good night.